Let's go. Let's go. Mets go. We're going to do it. We're going to. They played that fucking thing on the radio. I hated the Mets because of that. Remember when we first met John McClain? Our guy picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Alice. And with a little help from Alan, John McClain kicked out. Welcome back to Shaft Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Montgomery Fleming. Hi, y'all. And Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. Each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit us at shathamovies.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shout on TV. We review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. Find all that information and past episodes at shoutontv.com. And finally, if you'd like to hang out with us live all week long, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatthemovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and have special events. Currently, we've just gotten back into Destiny 2, and there might be a way that we get Big D to play Alien Fireteam Elite. Fuck yes. But do check it out. Uh, we are playing a little more frequently now uh, because I've, I've got the bug for Destiny 2. All that being said, Big D, what movie are we reviewing today? Uh, so, Gene, this week, we got a gift. Just like a distant relative we didn't know who dies and leaves us everything in their will, we are going to go back to 1985 and do a commission for Teddy N, and it is the legendary comedy classic, Brewster's Millions. Hi, guys. Love the pod. I've been with you since I discovered Game of Thrones between season six and seven. Late to the party, I know, but made for one hell of a binge. GOT Backlog, Watchmen, Westworld, among others, and now, of course, Shat the Movies. I made it through the entire catalog while doing my daily 90-minute walks attempting to lose weight. I'm 5'9", nearly 280 pounds, now down to 175 pounds. Nice. What a better life. I want to say a special thank you for all you do, as you've helped me beyond words, turning my 90-minute daily chore into a real pleasure. I've even walked longer than usual at times just to finish an episode. Half the time, I'm so in tune with the pod, I don't even realize I'm walking. Hey, just a thanks for always coming along with me. Hope I don't wear you out. Anyway, on to the business at hand. I wanted to treat myself to a birthday gift, and what better than a Shat movie? So I was thinking, what's been missing from Shat movies? Who deserves such a tribute? Then I thought, how about a movie from one of the greatest comedy legends with an entirely overlooked 80s and 70s movie career, including by you guys, Richard Franklin Lennox Thomas Pryor. I passed on Star Crazy Harlem Nights and almost went with moving, which I love, also hope you eventually do. Then it hit me. What better than an election year where the obvious choice is so clearly D, none of the above, than one of my preteen 80s favorites, Brewster's Millions. The thought of the sure thing inherited windfall versus unlimited windfall, having to earn it with unlimited resources with a clause for a limited time, it all captivated me. What would you do and how without giving away much from a washed up pitcher in the minor leagues for the Hackensack Bulls? I used to draw and color their uniforms after watching the movie, dreaming of playing the Yankees all the way to a potential political office all within a month and unwittingly dealing with trading places as saboteur bad guys along the way. Pryor is hilarious in the premise, and then toss in John freaking Candy? This was love at first sight. Easter egg, keep an eye out for a very young Lynn Shea cameo. But how does it hold up? For me, it isn't quite as it was, but still damn enjoyable to watch, if sentimental value alone. To me, it holds up like anything with John Candy usually does. So my score, 1.5 wipes. Love to hear yours. Looking forward to hear you guys rip it apart. Hoping Gene and Big D are on the pod. Thanks, guys. Love the pod. Teddy in. 
Well, thanks, Teddy, for the commission and, and happy belated, I guess, because <laughs> this was like a year ago or stuff like that during during the elections. Uh, but dude, so glad that we could help you on your weight loss journey. Um, I know Big D and I um, and Ash are all involved in like the chat on fitness challenges that we do. And it, it's really great to be able to motivate ourselves. And, and I'm the same way. Um, <clears throat> oddly enough, people listen to music when they're uh, at the gym. I, I like to listen to podcasts and they do make the time fly. Uh, they do. I, I recently came back from my mystery birthday trip with anyone who follows me on Twitter would know that Vanessa had planned for a year a mystery birthday trip for me, had no idea where we were going. It turned out to be Stockholm, Sweden, and you walk everywhere. So the timing was perfect. Like the last four days, uh, we were putting in 12 mile days, 20 plus thousand step days. Uh, so it was fun. So we're, we're glad we could help you. And thank you very much for taking us along on your uh, your long walks. Well, Brewster's Millions is a 1985 comedy starring Richard Pryor and John Candy based on the 1902 novel of the same name by George Barr McCutcheon. It is the seventh film based on the story. New York Times critic Janet Maslin said the film's slow pace and lack of style give it a <laughs> fatuous artificiality. The film holds a rating of 35% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 23 reviews. So Big D Ash, we always ask what your memories are of the movie we're reviewing. We'll start with you, Big D. What are your memories of Brewster's Millions? So one of my first memories of getting a cable box was the ability to stay up late at night and see things that you should not see. Mostly it was boobs. It was you know, <laughs> soft core movies like Hot Dog and where you might get a little bit of a uh, a little show for somebody of my age that would excite me. Um, but the other thing was the comedy. HBO was great. They were legendary. They had like the Eddie Murphy. First, it was delirious and then raw. But I always remember Richard Pryor. It was a stand up he did in the late 70s, early 80s. They would have that on as well. And that just blew my mind. He was saying things that I didn't know what half of them were, uh, but it was just so cutting edge. And he was just this wild man on stage. I absolutely fell in love with him. The movies, not so much. When he paired up with Gene Wilder and you had like the stir crazy, eh, you had the see no evil, hear no evil. I was like, eh, you're stretching. The toy, I think, don't, <laughs> wouldn't hold up well today, but I remember it being good. And then, of course, the the legendary computer hacker uh, in in Superman three. The first time uh, I saw Brewster's Millions, I was I was immediately uh, captivated, and then I think I saw that first, and then Superman three. I was like, "What the fuck is this?" So it's kind of the same boat as you, Big D. It was kind of the they're kind of ups and downs of, of Richard Pryor that I think shut me off to the rest of his library. Yeah, I've never seen this movie, but I obviously adore Richard Pryor. I don't know anybody really. For, that's kind of my in genes and around our age that was not a huge fan of his. I think he and Eddie Murphy were the first stand up that I ever saw that I remember seeing. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is what adult comedy is supposed to be. Like, yes. this is so different than the slapstick stuff or the things that like even my parents watched. It was it was just something that was set apart. I think he's absolutely a genius. And I got a little nervous because i not seen any of those movies that you guys are talking about. I know I know of them, but I have not seen them. And so I was like, ugh, but what if he's not a good actor? Because you know, sometimes like the funniest, like, can you imagine like Mitch Hedberg being an actor? Like that's right. like, maybe the worst thing ever. And so I was Norm McDonald. <laughs> Norm McDonald. Uh I was really, really concerned about that. But because I loved Richard Ryer, I was pretty excited to watch this one. What got me was how the audience reacted to what he was saying. I didn't get half of the drug references, the sex, but the crowd went fucking wild. And then that became a topic where you went to school and you talked to your friends and said, hey, what is what is a blow job? Hey, what, what is what is Coke? What is it? <laughs> in retrospect? My parents should have let me watch softcore porn and not let me watch this. This was much more dangerous to a young boy's development. I thought the Swedes were all down with kids watching softcore porn. They are, but we were in America, and you got the Italian grandmother, and the, it, was, it was different. All right, with that in mind, let's get to the trailer. Money. Everyone wants it. Until now, Monty Booster didn't have it. They tell me you're my only living relative. But he just made money the old-fashioned way. You have 30 days in which to spend 30 million bucks. He inherited it. If you can do it, you get 300 million. But if you fail, you don't get it. Why can't I tell my friends? Because I don't want anybody helping me out. What's wrong? What's wrong? $30 million. I mean, he's got $30 million. This 
is a good day, you know. He can't keep it unless he can spend it and have nothing left but the shirt on his back. Oh, well, we're going to have a, a lot of fun with this kind of money. <laughs> Jake, I'd like to hire you as my official photographer. Salary, $10,000 a week. How would you like to be my personal driver for the next 30 days at $5,000 a week? What a country. America, I love it. Hey, everybody, anybody want to go to lunch? Everyone thinks he's crazy. I want to bet $50,000. Then why not? We'll sell it. I think we should consider the possibility of psychiatric help. At the rate you're going, you'll have spent your entire inheritance in less than a month, and you'll have nothing to show for it. But $300 million says he's right on the money. Richard Pryor and John Candy. It's like that old saying, you know, if it's more money, I'd be a millionaire. I'm a millionaire. Brewster's Millions, coming soon from Universal Pictures. Monty Brewster is a minor league baseball pitcher with the Hackensack Bulls. He and his best friend, Spike Nolan, the Bulls catcher, are arrested after a post-game bar fight. A man offers to post their bail if they'll come to New York City with him. At the Manhattan law office of Granville and Baxter, Brewster is told that his recently deceased great-uncle Rupert Horn, whom he has never met, has left him his entire $300 million fortune. Brewster can choose to receive $1 million up front or attempt to inherit the whole estate by spending $30 million in 30 days. If he fails, a law firm becomes the executor of the estate, collecting a fee for performing this service and dividing the remainder among several charities. To succeed, Brewster may not own any assets that are not already his after the end of 30 days. So we talk about this movie as a Richard Pryor movie. Teddy you know, bought, brought up John freaking Candy. That was the real surprise for me in this movie. I remember loving this movie. It's one of my favorite movies. I forgot how good John Candy is in this. And this might be my favorite John Candy role, which I said, I think I've said three times now on different movies, but this yeah. is my favorite, yeah. favorite, favorite John Candy role. It's up there with Uncle Buck. Like in the great outdoors and planes, trains, and automobiles, he was like soft and fatherly and vulnerable, sometimes kind of dopey. But here we get spicy boy like he's intimidating people. He's getting in their heads. And as the movie opens up, my jaw dropped because we got this baseball scene where he just tells the batter, you almost had that. I bet you feel like a big piece of shit. <laughs> but but you know what? It's it's hard to do. And we, we joke about sometimes how in the 80s and 90s, like the big fat guy could be the romantic. We would see they'd have a hot wife. There'd be a romantic scene. The great outdoors has one. But in this he is believable. He's yeah. not intimidating at the least, but you believe he's the friend who would pick up a chair and smash it over a guy's head to protect his friends. When they're in there picking up some very attractive ladies that you're like, this, there's no way these, this dude's going to get anywhere. It somehow works. There is a grounded nature. He is your friend. He's the guy you knew, the guy who, who was next door, your best friend. Yeah, I got really bummed that it took until this point for me to know that this was like a part of who John Candy was able to be because he's not bumbly and he's not like you said, fatherly gene, you know, he's not heartwarming. He's young, like he's just this young guy and he was really funny. And I have to tell you, if you lined up like an entire row of actors from the 80s and you're like, okay, we're going to put these two in a movie together, I never would have paired up John Canty and Richard Pryor. Like, I didn't think that their two worlds and their types of comedy would ever mesh, but it was perfect. It really worked. And I think without John Candy, this would have been a, a much lesser film. I think part of the difference there, part of the the texture to all this and the way that he's operating a little bit differently is that this is very much a comedy from a black point of view. And I don't want to judge a movie star based on the merits of his blackness or, or compare and say, well, this actor is blacker than that actor. But I got to say, Richard Pryor movies, just they they just show a different attitude. Other movies that we've seen, like Beverly Hills Cop or Lethal Weapon or you know Trading Places even, we see a black man in a white world, and that movie is very clearly written from a white perspective. You're the black sidekick, or you're the black guy trying to navigate you know, white culture and how awkward is it, and that's the source of comedy. Here, uh, in Brewster's Millions, we get a taste of a black world. Like The vibe at that bar after the game is so different. It's so cool. The music is different. The cast has way more representation. I mean, you see so many more black characters in this movie. I mean, and we even get some jokes that are that are taking shots at white people. I mean, you got his great uncle saying, did you know your great uncle was a honky? For all the love we give 80s culture when we watch these movies, I got to say that black 80s culture was so much cooler and we really haven't begun to scratch the surface on those movies. I mean, to go back again to the stand up, 
that was a window for a suburban white kid into black culture. Hearing about like the hamburger sandwich and like cut the white bread. This ain't McDonald's or the barbecue or the way Richard Pryor would describe out dating and black women and what marriage was like. It was a window. But also, I think this time we forget they equally these guys, if you got big enough as an African-American comedian, White culture was not off base. It, it wasn't now that Dave Chappelle is breaking ground, making fun of white people. These guys would make fun of white people. And me as a white guy was like, oh, shit, this is funny. So it was it. We have to give them respect. They were true trendsetters. So here's Big D's favorite part of the podcast when we set up the rules. So <laughs> the deal for <laughs> Brewster like is he's got to get value for the services of anybody he hires to spend this $30 million. He can donate 5% to charity and also lose 5% by gambling. He can't give any money away just mm-hmm. as a gift. And he may not waste it by purchasing and destroying valuable objects. And then the final rule is he can't tell anyone, like not even Spike, about the deal or why he's spending the money the way he is. If he fails to spend the entire $30 million, he forfeits any remaining balance and he gets nothing. So Brewster decides to take that $30 million challenge. And then he's paired up with Angela Drake, who's a paralegal from the law firm. And she is supposed to keep track of his spending and keep all the receipts. So this movie, as we go from the baseball part to the bar fight to the you know legal repercussions to the whole $30 million deal, it's so smooth. Janet Maslin said that it had like no energy or that it was sluggish or whatever. I, I disagree. We follow these characters from the game to the bar to jail to New York City. And Richard Pryor and John Candy just bring what I would classify as wild cocaine energy to every scene. Like this movie is electric in my book. I think we're watching two pros in their prime and I was glued to the screen. You see, I think their friendship is genuine. They're bouncing lines back and forth. We talked about them trying to get laid at the bar and they're working the room like two pros. You know, John Candy's talking about, you know, here in in the West, when we're doing massages, all the energy goes into the clothes. Uh, We should take our clothes off. And I'm like, this is not going to work. There's there's no way this is going to work. And they're just going back and forth. And he's like, yeah, you know, it'd be great if the four of us nude. Before you know it, they're going off to the bus. They're going to get laid. And this movie has this heart. There's a spirit. There's a fun nature to it that was missing from Trading Places. This is what Trading Places could have been, but Trading Places went dark and cynical. This shit was so fun. And I think beyond that, what I really liked is that Monty himself, like as a character, he's not a joke. No. Like the punchlines are not his character himself. He's this really smart guy. And immediately he gets to work when he's given this scenario. He starts to spend money in ways that I think make a lot of sense. And within the confines of the rules, like a lesser movie would have had to have like, you know, a bumbly part where like he's like, wait, what? Explain to me again what this means. And instead he hears it once and he he gets going. And While we clearly can see that he doesn't have money, he's smart enough to spend that money wisely. And I really liked that aspect of this film. I I know we've mentioned Trading Places, and I think that it's a natural comparison with, with, you know, this time period and with the type of actors that are in it and the story that they're telling. And in a lesser film like Trading Places, the character, Eddie Murphy's character in that was made fun of. He was mocked before he became successful. And not here, even when the news is doing those you know feature stories uh, on him and they're like oh look at all of this excessive spending he's not the joke it's just a news story you could see how he would become the celebrity of sorts and i don't know i thought it made it a much more enjoyable film than other ones like this that we've seen before yeah and i think the character of montgomery he's having as much a difficult time with people looking at him like an idiot When they're like, you're burning your money, you're wasting it. That bothers him because he knows he's not dumb. Mrs. Drake, who he's he's trying to impress her. She's a good looking woman. She says, oh, I went to Loyola University. Do you know where that is? And he goes, yes, I know where it is in Chicago. I've been there. He is so unlike the characters that we've seen before. And it was a change I wasn't expecting. Meanwhile, I felt like a total dope because I'm like, yeah, Loyola, New Orleans. Like, there's another Loyola. <laughs> I think there's one in Maryland, too. Gene Lyons, academic. <laughs> but this, th- what makes this movie work besides John Candy and Richard Pryor is the cast. All the supporting characters, whether they're large, small, whether they come in for a couple seconds, they work. 
you have like Stephen Collins who plays Warren Cox. He is swarmy enough. He's slimy. You have Pat Hingle who plays uh, Roundfield, the friendly, good, like nurturing lawyer. You have the Rupert Horn is played by Hume Crone, who is a legendary actor and tons of stuff. Chuck Fleming, Peter Jason, another great actor. All of these, even down to like the photographer, add color to the screen and it makes everything more enjoyable that we're not depending on comedy from candy and prior just to carry the film can we also do a shout out to i think the character's name was rudy he was the batter from the opposing team like in the first yes uh, yes ass dude great ass holy shit that is the nicest ass i've Mm -hmm. ever seen on shot the movies that's pretty good it was tight it was tight it was literally yes (laughs) Well, Brewster rents an expensive hotel suite at the Plaza Hotel, hires personal staff on exorbitant salaries, and places bad gambling bets. However, Spike makes good investments, earning Brewster money. Realizing that he's making no headway, Brewster decides to run for mayor of New York City and throws most of his money at a protest campaign, urging a vote for none of the above. The two major candidates threaten to sue Brewster for his confrontational rhetoric, but they settle out of court for several million dollars. Brewster then hires the New York Yankees for a three inning exhibition against the Bulls with himself as the pitcher. You know, I know that we went through this whole argument on Mortal Kombat about the <laughs> lack of clarity and the rules. And I couldn't help but see Big D like with his notebook, like taking notes in that opening scene because of how specific there's this intense specificity of the rules that they give us that that Monty has to follow. And it's a ridiculous idea, but they commit to it so much. And you could tell this is not a writing team that slapped this together. They got together. They really thought about the details. And because of that and because of that cell, it really works. And I have to say that I think this would be really hard in the 80s to do. I know today, you know, my husband's in finance and he likes to tell me all the time that like a million dollars is not a lot of money anymore. Like objectively it is. But like if you, you know, win a million dollars in the lottery, it isn't like you're set up for, you know, the rest of your life anymore, even $30 million. Back then when money you know, the small amounts of money today mattered so much more back then, I I think it would be a really difficult ask. And today you could just buy a bunch of cryptocurrency and buy a bunch of drugs on the black market and, you know, be done because you'd have no assets left. But this is a lot of money to get rid of in the 1980s. You know, I'd argue at 41 that if I won a million dollars, I could probably live off it for the rest of my life. You don't have children. I don't. Yeah, they're expensive. So you open like a banana stand. You have them work the banana stand. They make it. So we're the blue family. Yeah. That's what we are here in this scenario. Yeah. yeah. But Ash, <laughs> the, the thing that came to mind, you know, said, you said Tom like said that millions not that much. Like I, I couldn't help but wonder if if my middle classness made it hard for me to think up how to spend that kind of money. Because I do this exercise all the time in my head where I'm like, okay, I, I could buy a dress shirt for like 20 or 30 bucks. It's a shitty one. Or I can go to my preferred dress shirt vendor, Hawes and Curtis. That's the official shirt tailor of, of Gene Lyons. And it's like 80 bucks for a shirt. And that to me is like, wow, that's an $80 shirt. Like, how expensive can a shirt be? How expensive can a meal be? And then I realized that like my imagination is limited by my tax yeah. bracket, right? I can't even imagine like a shirt that's $100,000, but I'm sure they exist. I mean, I think it was uh, Mace who said, Mace and P. Diddy who said, more money, more problems. (laughs) When your earning goes up, okay, your bracket, you still spend within the same percentage. So you just buy more expensive things. It's not like all of a sudden you're going to start saving all this extra money. You, You start to lead a different lifestyle and it's subtle. Your quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. You start buying more expensive sinks and fucking faucets and rugs and all stupid shit that normally you'd be like, hey, I'm going to go to Ikea. Gene might not, but I would. No, I mean, I, I'm looking up right now, Bergdorf Goodman, because I was like, what, what does a t-shirt cost? From Ber- a, a, a t-shirt with a with a pocket t-shirt from Bergdorf Goodman, $1,100. Yeah, it's fucking yeah. stupid. It's a fucking t-shirt. It's dumb. It's dumb. But but I want to I want to rewind here a little bit. And Ash, I have to address the ongoing Mortal Kombat slight that you two are slinging at me about the rules. <laughs> On my flight back from Sweden, I watched Mortal Kombat and I loved it. I thought it was good. They did a good enough job. I thought it was entertaining. I thought they laid out the rules. So my problem wasn't what. What I find real funny about that is like there's absolutely 
no explanation of the rules in the new one because of the fact it's not the actual tournament. It's a setup for the next movie and the background of Sub-Zero and Scorpion. So I think it's awesome that you love the rules of the movie that doesn't have rules. Yeah. Yeah. And the one where they're like, there's a tournament. You have to work your way up. He's like, I don't like it. This one, it's like, (laughs) hey, you got a birthmark. Done. It makes sense. No, we'll fight in the hockey rink. When we had the magic birthmark that appeared when you killed somebody, I was like, okay, I'm on board. I'm good. We're not (laughs) setting up and scheduling this giant tournament. I was okay with it. So whatever. And it was the new Mortal Kombat. Okay. So I I liked it. I thought it was entertaining. But (sighs) the other thing I want to address in this is the rules. They make them clear. Gene went through them. Okay. You have 30 days. You can't have any assets. Uh, you must get value for anyone that you hire. You have to donate or you can donate 5% to charity, 5% loss to gambling. Okay. You can't buy or destroy or waste money that has value. So here's the problem. It is against the rules to buy a Picasso and then turn it into firewood. They clearly say that in the movie, but then he buys something of value, the stamp, and then essentially devalues it by putting it onto a postcard and mailing it to the law firm. He doesn't devalue it. It's no longer his asset. It wasn't that he had to devalue it. It's that he could no longer own the asset. So if he puts it on the envelope and mails it out, then it's no longer his. Fuck. Okay, great. Attorney, you got that one. You're good. I'll give you that point. Next, you have to get value for services rendered. He hires the security guard who makes $350 a week and gives him $4,000 a week. He pays a lawyer $250,000 to decorate his office. He hires a cab at $5,000 a week. These are clear violation of the rule that says you have to get value for your service. But again, your salary, my salary, Gene's salary are all arbitrary evaluations of what we provide to our employer. So just like how if you go into a higher income bracket, you may buy the t-shirt at Bergdahl Goodman because that's what you value is $1,100 for a pocket t-shirt. Or you could go to Walmart and buy the black one that I just bought for my kid for a secret agent day that I bought for $6. It's the value you subjectively place in something. So if I think you're worth four grand a week then you're not you're not breaking the rules fuck it if i go by that i'm gonna give fucking the the lawyer 30 million dollars to redecorate my office it was kind of a fine line to to tread there and i I think the the point there was like the team that's evaluating your spending will kind of give Mm -hmm. you like a no that is not kosher or that is kosher but i think that the smartest move that he did by far and it's kind of commentary on what people with too much money do is get into politics and get sued right because that's that's about the most expensive game you can play he's fucking stupid he's wasting half of his time chasing miss drake and he's worrying about playing fucking baseball for the hack and sack bulls focus montgomery in 30 days you can you can spend the next year going after miss drake you could buy your own minor league team and actually play for them Stop nickel and diming things. This is where he goes wrong. He makes it hard for one person to account for $30 million. Don't go nickel and dime 50 grand here. I'm going to bet this 10 grand there. Go in big chunks. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to start off the easiest 5% right off the top. Bam. We're going to donate that to a charity. 5% gambling. Boom. We're done. Next, I am hiring value for service. I'm going to have a nonstop concert in my backyard. The lineup will be Prince, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Queen, U2, Metallica, Madonna, Tom Petty, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, the Guns N' Roses, early days, they'd be there in my backyard. And then I would just charter flights around the world for my cat. First class, just charter the entire plane flying around the world, and it's gone in like 10 days. Fuck your backyard. Rent Central Park. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine Red Central Park for a week, if you go to the city of New York and they're like, yeah, we don't do that. You're like, how about for $20 million? They'd be like, okay. And that's, yeah. and that's value. Yeah. When I think that's like the one critique I have about this film, it drags in a way because there were some easy solutions for him. And so it was fun to watch the gags of him spending money in the first like three or four people he went to. And it's like, what are you making a week? Okay, I'll triple that, right? Like, I'll give you a million dollars for the penthouse at the plaza. That stuff again and again got old for me after a while. And that's why like that, that, 
kind of that break there from when he gets to the plaza to when he decides to campaign, that part of the movie was really slow for me. And I got nervous that it wouldn't sustain itself. But once he decided to campaign, it picked up again. But I don't know. I just felt a little long. Now, again, I might be reading into this and I might be giving some meaning into something that really didn't in the film. But Brewster is supposed to learn to hate money. Right. In the video message, he says, you know, he gives the analogy. He was locked into a shed and had to smoke a whole box of cigarettes. He said, by the end, I could never think of smoking again. I'm going to make you think of money the same way. So as Brewster's going along and, you know, his friends are actually making money, which is setting him back. He is struggling. He is starting to hate money. It's becoming tedious. It, it is. It's wearing on him mentally. It's teaching him that lesson. I felt like as the audience, we were supposed to be along for that journey and to start hating it as well. It's kind of a silly lesson, which is part of the joke. Like that's part of the gag here is that it's not going to make him not want the $300 million. It's just going to make him be smart and maybe teach him the value of money. But I don't think it's going to teach him to hate spending it. Ash, you talked about how the movie kind of sags and that's your critique of it. What I didn't really understand was the baseball angle. So yeah. if you talk about like Brewster's Millions, like the original 1902 novel, baseball is you know not uh, a part of it. And I think they tried to like spice the movie up or make it more fun. And I'll admit that like seeing John Candy and Richard Pryor as baseball players was entertaining. I didn't mind it. I would have liked to spend more time just exploring New York City because I think they do a beautiful job showcasing the cool of 1985. Like that's a New York City that I miss. Like I was seeing parts of it and I was like, fuck, I remember when the city used to look like that. It was so cool. It was like a travel guide, but they didn't spend enough time doing that. There was too much time spent on on baseball. I was excited to go, oh, shit, they're going to do the 85 Yankees. That'd be fucking cool. Like, we're going to get to see the Yankees show up and play the Hackensack Bulls. And I'm like, they got Mattingly. They got Griffey. They got Ricky Henderson, Louisiana Lightning, Ron Guidry. And I didn't see any of those guys. Dude, but this was the Yankee team that I fell in love with. I started liking the Yankees in 84. And my love really developed because I hated the Mets. The whole 86 Mets. Let's go. Let's go. Mets go. We're going to do it. We're going to, they played that fucking thing on the radio. I hated the Mets because of that. So that drove me to the Yankees. So this was my fucking team. Dave Rigetti, Mike Pagliarulo, Willie Randolph, Dan Pasqua, a fucking Dave Winfield. But what blew my mind was they comment in the movie about, ooh, look at the big bad Yankees. These dudes were skinny and tiny. And going back and looking at the 85 Yankees, it's obvious there was no performance enhancing drugs other than maybe some coke and some uppers and some fucking speed because these dudes were skinny and tiny, much smaller than I remember. Well, blowing his last $38,000 on a party after the game, Brewster becomes fed up with money and is heartbroken that Spike, Angela and others around him do not understand his actions. On the final day, he finds that the sycophantic treatment he received from his entourage is gone. Shunned by everyone he knows, Brewster makes his way to the law office. Having withdrawn from the election, he learns that the city voted none of the above, forcing another election in which none of the previous candidates are running. So there is an intelligence to this movie that I think we alluded to, but we really need to dig a little bit deeper into. It succeeds where trading places got it wrong. It's a very smart statement on how money makes money and also on how increasing degrees of wealth lead people to spend in specific ways. It's it's pretty great. Yeah. I've got a friend, Chad. He's a very good guy. Like I love Chad. We're very close friends. I know Chad. He invested very intelligently when he was younger and he owns a lot of property now. He does shit for fun. Like he signed up with the Mesa Police Department <laughs> just to go through officer training so he could get free lessons on how to drive squad cars. And then as soon as that was done, he just dropped out. And I was like, what, you don't you don't want a job? And he said, no, man, a job gets in my way of making money. That's that's literally how life is for him, because money makes money. And it's it's such a statement on capitalism where we're just taught from a young age that hard work gets you money. You get rewarded for your hard work when you succeed in life. And there will always be an echelon of people above that who just have money because they have money. It's like that old meme that goes around every year, I feel like, during tax season, where it talks about what people should do with their refunds. And it's that thing where it's like, you know, people that are lower class 
economically middle class and upper class and what they do with extra money. Like if you're given $2,500, what do you do with it? Lower class pays off their debts. Middle class spends it. They go on vacations. That's their vacation fund, things like that. And upper class invests it, right? And so I think that's the point they're trying to make here. And that's what makes this movie realistic is that, you know, I, I said about how my husband says a million dollars isn't a lot. Well, a million dollars, if you don't need it, you can really become wealthy, right? Because then you can invest it and start making money really quickly. Because if you have a lot of money, you can make money really quickly. And so that's what he does here. When John Candy comes in, he's like, I made you $10 million, you know, off this (laughs) trade. Like, that's what would happen. That's why it's realistic to have these people around him who are trying. And I thought the dumbest choice that he made was hiring a financial advisor. Because if you don't want anybody to know that you need to get rid of all this, the last thing you want is somebody making smart moves with your money. And with that, with Without that complication, I think this plot is way too thin. And so I was really glad that they brought that aspect in. Well, the financial advisor was hired by Spike against Montgomery's wishes. He brought him in because he wanted him to start making money. But the point is, if you're rich, it takes a lot for you to lose your money. You have to be fucking stupid. If you gave me $10 million, inherently me being as conservative as possible with investments, I could live off that and continue to grow it. It is really difficult. In in like 11th grade, I can remember my social studies teacher walked us through the magic of compound interest and said, okay, if you guys all put $50 away, like to say per week at what you would have at age at your retirement age. And I remember us were like, oh, 50 bucks, I would do this and that. When you figure it out, holy shit, man, it's, it's so hard to lose. And that's the difficult thing that even though he's trying to burn it, he's inherently making it. Right. But like the fun thing about capitalism, right, is that compound interest makes half the population or, well, 10% of the population really, really wealthy. And compound interest makes the whole rest stay in debt forever, which is why it takes, you know, 15 years to pay off a $2,000 credit card bill. So compound interest is great for people who have money to invest, but it's the way that like we shackle people into the other, you know, classes and society. And I think that's what's so great about Monty is he's not a dude that's coming with money into it. He's a guy who doesn't have money and he doesn't understand the difficulties, which is that investment piece, because that's not been a part of his life before. And I think that's why he plans for everything. And that's what trips him up, because he didn't realize that that would be the complication. Yeah. And and Gene, you said in there that all the hangers on have kind of fallen by the wayside, not Spike. Spike is a genuine friend. Spike, again, John Candy steps up. Other movies we would see Brewster down on his luck, out of money, and all the hangers on walk away. And we'd see Spike, who's now changed, driving like a Ferrari and pulling away like, bye, Brewster. No, here, he says, you know what? He says, Brewster, it's okay. I took the money you gave me and I invested it. I didn't spend it. We have it. Let's go buy a Corvette. You and I, we're going to drive to the Rockies. We'll get a cabin. We'll go fishing. He is a true friend. I was looking into it because I wanted to know if these guys are like lifelong friends or because it felt very genuine to me as well. And the rumor is that Richard Pryor actually couldn't stand John Candy at all. I think Paul Mooney told the story because Richard Pryor had Eddie Murphy on set uh, while they were filming this and they were kind of hanging out and they're really good buddies. And I guess John Candy was like kind of felt like left out and was asking around like, hey, I feel like Richard Pryor doesn't like me. And everyone's like, yeah, he really actually doesn't. Like, I felt really bad for John Candy because I feel like he does a really great performance here and he's he's helping Richard Pryor shine. Uh, but, you know, we, we've had our own experiences with personality conflicts on the pod. So I, <laughs> yes. I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you guys were best friends. It always sounded like you were having so much fun. <laughs> Little did you know. Well, Warren Cox, a junior lawyer from the law firm and Angela's fiance, has been bribed by the firm to ensure that Brewster fails to spend the entire $30 million. Moments before time expires, Cox hands Brewster some money previously thought to have been spent and informs him he is not broke. Shortly before Brewster signs, Angela learns of the plot and reveals it to him. Brewster punches Cox, who threatens to sue and declines Brewster's offer of the money as compensation. Realizing he'll need a lawyer, Brewster pays the money to Angela as a retainer. With the transaction completed and all the money now gone, Brewster fulfills the terms of the will and inherits the entire $300 million. So I have to admit, for a comedy, the end was surprisingly really 
tense. I didn't really know where they were going. I think there were a couple of different options. You know, I didn't know, okay, well, maybe he's not going to get it. He's going to run for office for real and that'll change his life. Or maybe he'll just be broke and they'll go with the comedy aspect. But I have to say, after all, considering all the options, I'm really glad that he won in the end. Uh, Typically, I think that that kind of ending was really cheesy. But the way that they sell the tension, you find yourself going like, no, no, come on, like, let him have it like he deserves it. And so him getting it kind of just feels right. And that's so different than trading places. Because we talked about how the end when they're on that beach, and they're all matched up with a color wheel for the people who look just like them on that beach, like, they just look like a bunch of assholes, right? And in this film, he does and he's a good guy and you want him to win and you want him to win for the right reasons. And I liked it. Oh, I, I totally agree. You're looking at them through the window and Brewster is such a humble down to earth guy. Yeah. He's like, Hey, I lost. It's over. It's okay. I'm going to sign. Where do I sign? He's not having some last minute dash trying to save it. They almost have to push him. No Brewster. We have two minutes. Let's do it. And it was wonderful. And I think that Brewster's a character. I think he is changed. He was always down to earth. But in this, we see him. He enjoyed giving to others, going and feeding people these huge extravagant meals. I want to believe in my head, I'm writing the sequel here, that that Brewster will lead a life of philanthropy and giving and him and Mrs. Drake will get together uh, and they will have a, a positive chapter. But what do you guys think if they ever, God forbid, made a Brewster's part two or there was a novelization of it? What do you think happens to Brewster in the next chapter? I mean, if Richard Pryor were still around, I would (laughs) love to see uh, Brewster part two. So so check it out. Here's my setup, right? The sequel is they have another election. Brewster runs for real this time. He's got $300 million in his war chest, right? He becomes mayor of New York. And then he's got to clean up New York's finances. So, for instance, maybe, I don't know, fix the subway so they're not fucking flooding when a storm comes through. Mm. Maybe even reach a little bit into New Jersey, extend a a hand to Hackensack and and help them out uh, as well. But I would love to see him take his no-nonsense, joyful populism uh, to become the, the best mayor New York has ever had. And of course, there's got to be like some bad guys that are trying to like ruin the city or something. And then some Ninja Turtles, maybe. Yeah, let's just hope uh, that Brewster never gets a taste for the Coke. Cocaine would ruin it all. (laughs) Jesus. No, God, that's, that's where I thought you were going at first. I started thinking about like how Richard Pryor actually went wrong. When he was freebasing and burned his head, I, I for some reason that popped into my head, and I was like, "No, Brewster, no, stay away from the drugs." What's crazy is that was before this movie, yeah. was it? Yeah, he yeah. fucking set himself on fire before, before. Brewster's movie. He oh, looks great. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Wow, they did a good job. <laughs> well, now is the time we give our chat score for Brewster's Millions. Our wipe score tells you how many wipes the movie takes to get off your respective butts. Zero wipes is a perfect movie. It is Richard Pryor in a suit. Can we talk about Richard Pryor in a suit? He looks fucking good in a suit. Yeah, because mm-hmm. he's skinny. <laughs> yeah, you always look better in a suit when you're skinny. Fat guys in suits don't look good. I think suits do chubby guys favors. Yeah, anything does fat guys favors. If it's not an off-the-rack suit. Yeah, a larger true, man true, has to true. have a tailored yes, suit I agree. for it to not <laughs> either make him look like a box or to make him look like a sausage. Yeah, or they're wearing a diaper. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. Or like what's his ass in the usual suspects. Gabriel Byrne. Gabriel Byrne looking like a pale banana. (laughs) Five Wipes is an absolute disaster of a movie. It is achieving the understanding that capitalism doesn't reward hard work as much as it rewards wealth. Ash, we'll start with you. How many wipes did you give Brewster's Millions? I really liked this movie. I thought it was funny. I thought it was smart. I was happy to see that Richard Pryor is an actual actor, that he isn't just an onstage comedian. But I do think it was too long. And I do think it dragged for the middle portion, but I still think it's a way better than average film, especially for this time period. So I'm going to give it a solid 1.5 wipes. All right. That's one and a half wipes for Ash. I'm going to come in just below that with one wipe. This is one of the few movies that immediately after watching it, I wanted to go out and rewatch it with everybody I know. I wanted to call my cousins, my mom, my friends. I was like, hey, everybody, let's watch Brewster's Millions. I I seriously would watch this movie five more times this month if I could. It just feels good. It's so smart. And the only thing that's holding it back, I think, is the baseball thing. The the movie's based on that 1902 novel. And its scenarios are much more interesting, uh, much more diverse. It's not so focused on that baseball subplot. 
And I think if you stuck with that original formula, a man trying to win back the love of his life, burdened with the secret of why he needs to spend so lavishly, it becomes an infinitely more interesting film. But it's still a fantastic movie. And so I'm going to stick with that one wipe score. Uh, I agree with you, Gene. I'm going to go with one wipe. The movie makes you feel good. It's smart enough that you think, okay, could this really happen? And and part of, I almost did a shat on the law. Like when we watched The Goonies and I went back and researched the, the law of, of salvage, whether or not The Goonies could keep the diamonds. Here, I started looking into the legality of the will. And it turned out, yes, you could do this with some caveats. But that didn't matter. It was a smart enough movie that it was believable. The way he spent the money became fun trying to think, how would you spend the money? And I thought I'd outsmarted him. I'm like, oh, just do commercials. Boom. Next second, he's running for office. I'm like, the movie's smarter than me. And that was what made it great. Again, performances, the supporting cast. It was a joy. One wipe for me wholeheartedly. And I recommend people going out and rewatching it. All right, so that's one wipe from Big D, one wipe from me, and one and a half wipes from Ash. That gives us an average wipe score of 1.16 repeating wipes for Brewster's Millions. So Gene, with a score of 1.16 repeating wipes, that now ties this with a whole bunch of movies. In the 49 (laughs) spot, it ties it with Coming to America, Raising Arizona, Braveheart, Heat, When Harry Met Sally, The Karate Kid, Better Off Dead, City of Lost Children, and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. So it's a a big group of movies there, but I think it fits in very well. I want to take this moment again to recalibrate for the audience because I got taken to task for giving Die Hard one wipe. One wipe is a very good movie, guys. Yeah. Like, this is a it is. I love it. Zero wipes is it's perfect, right? So I think that we need to calibrate that scale. Two is yeah, I like it. One is I love it. Zero is it is perfect. Is this a perfect movie? No. Do I love this movie? Yes. So people should be honored with a one wipe score. Yeah, Agreed. Totally agree. And speaking of honors, uh, we have a terrific email that came in this week. Ash, if you do the honors of sharing that with us. Absolutely. It says, Dear Shack Crew, it was the first night of Thanksgiving break of my senior year in high school when one of my dear friends and I ventured to our little movie theater downtown to see Interview with the Vampire. He was the only one of my friends at that time that had also read the books. My mom was letting me read Stephen King and Anne Rice at the age of 12, say hello to my dark baby angst. So we were so excited to see this dark, beautiful world brought to life. Afterwards, in the cold autumn rain, we went to a local diner to drink coffee and smoke cigarettes and talk about the movie and books for hours. To be honest, this is one of many warm, fuzzy movie experiences I had with someone close to me while growing up. As a kid, a teen, an adult, a mom, the movies would always remain a source of magic and joy for me. I share this with you because as much as I've enjoyed the podcast for quite some time now, this was the first time I was truly captured by the vivid and joyful memory of seeing the movie for the first time. The first of many. I would go on to see it at the matinee a number of times during that Christmas break with various friends. While listening to you guys gush over it, I could feel the rain on my face as we walked out of the movie theater into the night, talking over each other about all the things we loved. I can hear the clinging of dishes and smell of cheap coffee in my Marlboros and the diner afterwards. Yes, we could still smoke in restaurants back then. Not that it matters as it's been 19 years since I had one. I can feel the excitement that only a teenager can feel on the eve of the first holiday break from school. I guess all I really wanted to say was thanks for the beautiful and enjoyable walk down memory lane. Megan. Well, Megan, I can I can honestly say this is one of my favorite emails that we've ever received. Not that we rank them, but that really just resonated with me because I think that we're on the same page in the way that we view the world and the way that we remember when I connect with individuals who who have that type of memory and that type of like intense capture of the moment where those little details like stick out to you. Um especially when it surrounds one of those life life changing moments like the first time you see interview with the vampire. Uh just it meant a lot to get your email, so I appreciate it. And I think the other thing, too, is that we joke all the time about 
you know, this being like a goth podcast because of Jean and I both being on here, like being twins. But like there is a group of us that through, you know, various experiences and through various degrees of alienation, like there were few things that spoke to us growing up. And this was really a film that was part of that. It's it's a universal thread for the same type and like-minded people. I've never met someone who has the passion for a movie like Interview with the Vampire that I do not become fairly decent friends with and don't relate to on a level that other people just don't get to with me. And so I got really excited. And it's that deep, you know, cynical romantic, I think that's in each of us, you know, you describing walking through the rain and the taste and the smell of cigarettes. I mean, that romanticism, that nostalgia that isn't, you know, cheesy nostalgia, but nostalgia for a time that we felt something for the first time, I think is really beautiful. And that film made me feel that way. And in a way, your email made me feel those things all over again. So thanks so much, Megan, because really made my day. Uh, Ash, I agree. And Megan, thank you very much. As much as this is a podcast where we review movies, it is the experience of the movie. I can remember, even though I hated Edward Scissorhands on the rewatch, I remember what it felt like walking from the theater with my friends. It was snowing. We had just left the high school basketball game. Even now I get goosebumps. Just the memory of the experiences around the movies that we all share. So whether or not I was walking in the rain after interview with a vampire, your email struck a chord with me and made me think of all the emotional moments that are stamped on my personality that were meaningless at the time, but now going back, they were some of the best moments of your life, the purest moments with friends. So thank you very much for writing. And I'm really, really glad you're along with us for the ride. And guys, if you'd like to write in, don't forget you can email us anytime at hosts at shatthemovies.com and we will read those. Not necessarily on the pod, but we're going to read those and they mean a yes. lot to us. Uh, you can also call us and leave a voicemail, 914-719-SHAT. And we have two voicemails this week, uh, one from Don Sauce and one from Hot Sauce Steve. So it's a saucy voicemail block. <laughs> hey, this is Grigio Pino here. <laughs> I was calling to accept Big T's invitation to do The Last of Us podcast with him. Although, I just listened to y'all's voicemail. It sounds like Big T's really tired, something like that. But then, too, I was listening to the podcast about Lampoon's vacation. And I got to say, I mean, Clark goes around, he drags a dog to death. He defrauds an innkeeper. Yeah. He abducts poor Russ at gunpoint. And then he goes and he defiles his aunt's body. <laughs> but the thing that makes him a bad guy is wanting to bang Christy Brinkley in a Ferrari. I don't know. <laughs> Rito Pigio out. Hey, I listed all of those horrible things that he did. I was just saying that he's he's remembered as the family man, but yet he was pressing his dick up against Christy Brinkley's belly button. Wasn't Don Sauce the, the guy you were in a walking shootout with during the shutdown on fitness this last round? It was. I Yes, he did. He took me out in the end, but I closed a 50,000-step gap while in Stockholm. So, Don Sauce, you're lucky. If I had a couple more days, I would have caught you. I would have tracked you down. All right, and from Don Sauce, let's move on to Hot Sauce Steve, whatever the fuck he called about. <laughs> hey, crew. It's once again Hot Sauce Steve. Uh, just listened to the National Lampoon episode, and uh, you're talking about wanting to do another TV show. I have two suggestions for you. Um, the first, if you are in Discord or follow me on any social media, which several of you do, uh, you know I post constantly about the Wheel of Time. I think it's going to be bigger than Game of Thrones. It is the most epic fantasy series ever written. I think you guys should cover it. Also, of course, Lord of the Rings would be another great show to cover. Both Big D have cost more than uh, any show ever created. Lord of the Rings, of course, being the most. I think Game of, or, uh, Wheel of Time is going to cost $500 million for the first season, eight episodes, and then Game of Thrones, or, or I keep saying Game of Thrones. Lord of the Rings is almost a billion dollars for the first season. So... Amazon's putting a ton of money in both these shows. I think you guys should cover it. It's going to be great. Anyways, have a great day and talk to you later. So look, 
I am a massive Lord of the Rings fan. I'm also a big Wheel of Time fan. But guys, like we found out so quick that the fandom, like any small detail, there are no bigger issues I feel like than we would have with Lord of the Rings fans and with Wheel of Time fans because they're such complex stories. And I just want to point out to you too, Hot Sauce Steve, Gene had done something sometime referring to the the prequel to Lord of the Rings. It was a whole Twitter thing. So like <laughs> even like that tiny detail, like we would get burned alive. So I recently did a Lord of the Rings marathon at my house. It was 11 hours long. Uh, Sarah and I provided all the food, all the booze. We had a beer for every race of the fellowship. So people could like choose from those. I made cocktails. I made the Eye of Sauron and also the Shire. Uh, the Eye of Sauron, by the way, Ash, don't tell anybody this, but I basically just copied the recipe for La Louisiane, but I just called it Eye of Sauron and everyone was nice. like, these are amazing. You're a genius. Uh, <laughs> the greatest bartender ever. Dark arts. But uh, but you know, but but during that, I realized that I watch Lord of the Rings very differently from other people. Where I I watch Lord of the Rings as a party movie now, like the entire series, right? Like I watch them very seriously when they were in theaters and, and enjoy them for that aspect. But Lord of the Rings to me now is a drinking game party uh, a series of films because it there's so much like meme wise and comedy wise to reference on there. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'm yelling out like "meets back on the menu, boys," you know, or something like that. It's just like it's 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 what it is and so yeah. i i will probably watch the series but i'm gonna watch it with like joy in my heart and a and an idiot abandon i'm not analyzing that thing at all burned alive yeah no the other concern i have is with wheel of time if we're going to take a moment to talk about that i am very worried about any show with a bright color palette and very young attractive people in it like one of the things i liked about Game of Thrones is you had some older and not necessarily super hot people on the show. Wheel of Time, it's a very good looking cast. And that to me is always like a red flag. Yeah, I mean, they look like the cast of like Teen Wolf on yes. MTV. Like they look really hot. And beyond that, I do really enjoy Wheel of Time, but Wheel of Time is so complicated. You know, Game of Thrones gets more complex as it goes. Like the first book is not as complicated as the ones that follow. You kind of, you know, and look at the series, you sit with the Starks for a good while, the Starks and the yes. Lannisters, and then you get to know the others. But you know, Wheel of Time, man, we're going to need full on whiteboards like that meme from uh, It's Always Sunny. That is what you need to figure out Wheel of Time. And, and, you know, poor Big D wasn't asking for show suggestions. He was saying they made it. They're making a TV show based on a video game. I think it's something that I could wrap my arms yeah. around. I want to do a podcast about it. No, because I enjoyed I read all the comics up until all the Walking Dead comics up to like 112. It was one of the one of the trips to Brazil before we had good Internet. Uh, Roger had shared his comic book login. So I went and read all of them. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the show up until like season six. I played the video game for The Last of Us. I loved the zombie genre, but I don't want to go back and watch fucking 12 hours of movies. I still haven't even seen the two prequel Lord of the Rings. What? The one with the Ed Sheeran song and the fucking big dragon and shit. No, it's just too much right now. With the Desolation of Smog? No, I haven't watched that. You're talking no. about the the Hobbit series? Yeah, I haven't watched that. Ed Sheeran is Ed Sheeran in... does a song. It's like about the fire and the mountains and shit. Yeah, Ed okay, Sheeran. I mean, The song. Hobbit is a great book. Let me just defend The Hobbit for a second. I'm not going to read the book. So what about the movie? The book is an easier read than watching all three <laughs> okay. films. So. But no, Lord of the Rings is wonderful. It's a big thing in my life, but oof. Don't want that fandom coming after us. So hot sauce, Steve, I think we can arrive on this compromise, right? Uh, how about in the Discord, we'll have a channel <laughs> for Lord of the Rings. We'll have a channel for Wheel of Time dedicated. I will watch the shows. I will talk about the shows with you. Uh, but yeah, doing a pod on either of those is... Uh, listen, there are so many good podcasts out there. And I'm sure that there are going to be some very talented people picking them up. But right now, I mean, we're booked through December of 2022 just on movies. In January. Uh, we're booked through January of 2023 <laughs> just on movies. And so it would be a better use of our time, honestly, to pump out two a week uh, of movies than to be doing TV, which I'm sure other people uh, are perfectly capable of doing because, uh, you know, I'm sure there are some people out there who are incredibly big fans of Wheel of Time or Lord of the Rings who could do a much better job than, than we could, as we learned on Lovecraft Country. Jesus. Big D, what do we have coming up next week? 
Well, Gene, we go from a lighthearted comedy about spending $30 million in 30 days to something a little darker. Amoral teen Telly has made it his goal to sleep with as many virgins as possible, but he doesn't tell them that he's HIV positive. (laughs) While on the hunt for his latest conquest, Telly and his best friend Casper smoke pot steal from shops around New York. Meanwhile, Jenny, one of Telly's early victims, makes it her mission to save other girls from him. But before she has a chance to confront him at a party, everything goes horribly wrong. And this was commissioned by Lisa C. And fuck, this uh, this made me feel like I had laid down on the floor of a 7-Eleven bathroom. This made me feel dirty. Whew, it's going to be a, an interesting podcast. I, w- I avoided watching this for the podcast for a very long time until like I absolutely had to. Same. Thank you, Lisa, for commissioning the next movie. And thank you so much, Teddy, for commissioning Brewster's Millions, the feel-good movie we needed before next podcast. And thank you all commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shout Out the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shout Out the Movies. You can email us, host at shoutthemovies.com, or call us, 914-719-SHAT. You can support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website, shatthemovies.com. Also, if you have not already, subscribe to our Twitch channel. It's really, really easy to do. Just go to shatthemovies.com slash Twitch, uh, and then you can use your Amazon Prime benefit to use to connect it to Twitch Prime, and you get a free monthly subscription to our stream which helps us out financially so we really appreciate it it's, a, it's just free money also you can check out our sister podcast shout on tv we review tv series such as lovecraft country westworld true detective taboo american gods game of thrones and watchmen find all the information on our website shout on tv.com wherever we're fine podcasts can be found including itunes google play stitcher and youtube be sure to subscribe and if you stop by itunes please leave a five-star review that helps the podcast grow on behalf of my co-hosts ash and big d i'm gene lyons be sure to join us next week for the following movie